John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. The whole world. Everyone. Anyone. That's a lot of people. That he gave his one and only son. His only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish. But have eternal life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you poured out on us this week, for bringing us together to worship. And we thank you for Pastor Dan being here this morning. Be with us and help us to worship with right hearts. Help us to be so thankful because we know we are so blessed. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.
When you built this building, it was a place where you would come and be together in fellowship and worship the Lord. I think of when Jesus was coming in on those final days of his ministry on, on earth, that he came into the temple and he was upset with what was going on. 
And he said, don't you know that my father's house should be a house of prayer for all nations? And that's why we're here, to meet with God. Would you join me in prayer? Oh God, thank you for your presence here with us. You are an everlasting God. And I think about what the psalmist declared over and over again, that your steadfast love endures forever. We thank you just as the video this morning was declaring that you love this world so much that you sent your only son to live and die and then to rise again to offer us eternal life, not just living forever, but to know you, to experience the very presence of your Holy Spirit within us. We worship you. And we open ourselves to the ministry that you want to do within us to continue to draw us to yourself and to continue to bring glory to yourself in and through us as we live out our lives in our everyday existence. And Lord, we're so thankful that you've encouraged us to come, even in our anxieties, with our prayers and petitions, but to do so with thanksgiving. And we do give thanks because you are a God who not only knows what we're going to pray, but you're already at work. And so in some sense, our prayer is joining you in what you're doing. And I do lift up this church, these body of believers, as they continue their search for the person that you've invited to come and continue to lead them in their ministry here in this community. I pray that you would just continue to bring a revival to the life of these people and that through their lives, they would begin to see an awakening in this community. We see that happening across the nation in many places, even across the world. We're so thankful that you continue to bring people to yourself in Christ Jesus. And Lord, then we realize that each of us here have individual needs, needs of, that we have been bringing to you about our families, our friends, even ourselves. And thank you, Lord, that you said to us, that even before a word is on our lips, you know it full well. And so thank you for hearing our prayer. Even those silent ones now, we offer up to you. And Lord, thank you for the opportunity now to give. Give back to what you've first given to us. And may it bring honor and glory to you at Christ Jesus. Amen.
I think of the words of that song that remind us of the presence of God here with us and that we want to be open to his presence. Now it's interesting the various traditions that have looked at communion. Obviously the Catholic tradition believes that the presence of God resides within the bread and in the wine once the priest lifts it up. Lutherans believe that it's both bread and wine, continues to be bread and wine, but the real presence of God is in that. Presence, the Presbyterians kind of believe that there is a presence associated with celebrating communion. And we Baptists, we believe the presence resides in the fact that we are all God's children, that we have the very Holy Spirit living within us. You know, what's interesting is I think about the various traditions. We're all looking at the presence of God as we come to this table. And that our life, our being, our salvation, our forgiveness from sins, the love that we have, all comes from God. So as you eat this bread and drink this cup today, that we remember it is representative to us of the very presence of God, the forgiveness of God in Christ Jesus, and the life that we have in him. Whether you're a member here at this church or not, we invite you to celebrate with us as we celebrate this. It's interesting that one of the names of this is called Eucharist, the Great Thanksgiving. And let's give thanks. Oh God, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for how we as a church around the world, no matter what our tradition, celebrate your presence as we come to this meal. And so we want to be very open to you as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup we do pray that we will know the intimate presence that we have by your Holy Spirit in and through Christ Jesus Amen Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you. Take, eat, and remember me. And Jesus, after the supper, took the cup and lifted it up and said, This is the new covenant which is in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. One of the things that the church did in the early days was to take up a fellowship offering to help those in the community they had needs as well as those within the congregation. And I guess the reason I'm leaving these open here is to realize that there's still bread to go around. There's still the blood of Christ which is shed for all. And so there's room. There's room for more. Here, in light of the fact that we have been asked by God to join him, and go reaching, reaching, reaching as we sang, and building, building, building. Give in honor of Jesus.
I'm not sure I have the right one. We'll see. Is it working? Okay. It was interesting uh, as I was preparing to preach again here with you as we worship together. I was thinking, where do I go? Where do I go? And I thought, well, maybe I'll look at the lectionary. Well, I'll show you how stupid I am. I looked at the wrong year. I didn't find that out for a couple more weeks, but then I realized, well, maybe God did that on purpose. Maybe he wanted us to look at Psalm 27. If you would, you can join me as we read together, or I mean, as I read for you, Psalm 27. I'm not sure that I have the right clicker. It's not moving for me. Oh, are you doing it or me? You're doing it. Okay, well, I'll point at you when you, okay, great. You know, when I was a kid growing up, we used to sing this song. The Lord is my light and my... I can't do it. I'm very good. not very good at it. Do you remember that, Claudia? you remember that? Oh, it's an old anthem. Shows you how old I am. Older than you, right. But it, it, the, the, the songwriter was picking up from Psalm 27, which is a great psalm. And listen as I read. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, men, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, that I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face I will seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I should look, shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Well, this is the second Sunday of Lent, which was on our uh, bulletin, I mean, on our screen when we first started. And to realize in Lent that it is a time of drawing closer to Jesus. We can go to the next slide. It's uh, it's really representative, and I think you're going to have to go to the next one. Too bad. Okay, yeah, just bring them all up for this slide. Is that good? Oh, went too far. All right. It's representative of Jesus for fasting for 40 days before he began his ministry. It's representative of of the Israelite children being in in the wilderness for 40 years of Moses being on the mountain for 40 days. And so during this time, the church set aside to have 40 days of fasting, of seeking God, and drawing closer to him. But then realizing that it's really not good to fast on the feast day, which is Sunday, the day when communion is already celebrated, or the agape meal is celebrated. So it really turns out to be 46 days of Lent, from Ash Wednesday until Maundy Thursday is 46 days. Six Sundays of feasting, celebrating around the table of the Lord, and 40 days of fasting. 
It is a time of remembering that we are from dust, and that's why on Ash Wednesday, many churches put dust, so to speak, or ashes that have actually been left over from Palm Sunday the year before uh, on, on a person's, to remind them from dust we are to dust we shall return. It is a time uh, the, to seek Jesus and recognize and confess those activities or possessions that distract us from God. And I think that may be the next slide. Yeah. And so this psalm really causes us to seek. Next slide. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Go to the next slide. Of, and all the days of my life. And to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This, this verse really kind of resonates with me in that, that we are to seek to dwell with the Lord. If you want to go to the next slide. And we see that as example of Jesus, even at the age of 12, where do his parents find him after they were there for the, the Jewish holiday? They found him in the temple. And he said, and he said to them, why, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? 12 years old. Jesus is wanting to be in a place to, to learn more about his father. And it says that, that, that he kind of amazed them, that he was asking questions. <laughs> and, and to think, I wonder what a 12-year-old would be asking, but they, they were amazed at the questions he was asking. They, they were deeper than many probably other 12-year-olds. And, and then they were amazed at sometimes of, of the insight that he seemed to have. Why do you think that is? Because he was fully human. I believe it was because he learned a lot from his mom and dad growing up, that they spent time. In fact, it goes on after this verse that says that he, when he returned home, he grew in the measure of stature and wisdom and the love of God. And man, there was this sense of, of the family together sharing and living out the traditions and the, and, the, and the realization of God was present, that the Lord was their God. But then but Jesus really took it upon himself to know that, that this was not just a religion to go through, not a, not a habit or traditions to do, but this was every time as he came to the Torah, every time he came to synagogue, it was to meet with his father, just as for us. And so we need to follow the example of Jesus himself, that we would seek to be, to be like Jesus. And the next slide says that we gather with the people of God. And that's a sad thing that's happening in our society today, that, that we have become so individualistic that we think that we can meet God all by ourselves. And we can. But we miss out on so much when we don't gather. Worship was going on even before the music started. Worship was going on when we greeted one another as we came into the building, when we laughed, when we joked about being being a redhead. We were connecting with one another and sharing stories. And I found out that these two women that I was sitting next to, her son is a redhead, and, and the woman next to her was a redhead herself. And I, I, I joked one time with my sister and I, who is also a redhead, she said, I said, she's turning gray and mine's going away. But that's part of worship. It's part of the gathering. And I think I shared with you before that the Ascent Psalms, which is Psalm 121 through about 133, are those times when they're coming together as they make their way to the temple to worship. They're singing songs. They're sharing with one another. And many of them haven't seen each other probably for months, or maybe since the last time they gathered, as they make their way to the temple. And then when they got to the temple, even as I shared, it was a time of meeting God. So we are encouraged, and that psalm really is about gathering with other believers as we seek to dwell with the Lord. That, that, and in fact, I heard somebody say, as we were praying, that the Lord's house, this is the Lord's house. We've set this aside so that you and others could come and meet with God and one another. And, and the other thing is that, that we also need to be attentive to the fact, if you want to go to the next line, 
to the, the fact that God also indwells us. Not only do we go someplace to experience God and dwell with others, but God dwells with us. At one point, in, again, in this Gospel of Luke, where we saw Jesus in the temple, he says that he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, and he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And sometimes I think we can become so future-minded that we're looking for the kingdom to come someday, and we forget the fact that the kingdom for us is here and now as well. The fulfillment will come one day. But you and I are experiencing the indwelling of God now. We're experiencing the kingdom now because eternal life, as Jesus pointed out in his prayer, eternal life is not where we live, but with whom we live. He said, Father, may they know that you are the true God. And this is eternal life. That they may know you're the true God and Jesus Christ, your son, whom you have sent. So you and I are experiencing eternal life right now. It doesn't come after we die. <laughs> That's the fulfillment of it. But we're experiencing you know, that, that every time a thought comes to you about the Lord, whether in prayer or devotions or in conversation with others, it is a reality of experiencing the presence of God indwelling us. We're experiencing eternal life. Well, if we, if we go on, the next thing that we see in verse 8, if you want to go on to the next one, it, he, he, he now talks to the Lord. And I love this psalm. You know, the psalms often, they begin talking to us, and then someplace in those psalms, the psalmist begins to talk to God. I don't know if you ever noticed that in Psalm 23. Maybe I've shared this with you before, but he talks about the Lord as his shepherd. But when he's getting to the darkest point, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he never long talks to us. Now he's talking to, for you, or if we use the old King James, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In the midst of the darkness, he turns and experiences the presence of God in ways that gives him confidence, in a ways that give him comfort, in a way that gives him that sense of security. And he talks to God. And so here in this psalm, he says, you have said, seek my face. And he responds, my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Your face, Lord, do I seek. And so the next slide really kind of reminds us not to, not to seek his hands, but seek his face. I hate to say this, but many times our prayers have been filled with what God can do for us. Do this, do this, do this, do this. But in this psalm, he says, I long to dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Now, it's interesting, in my message, I was, I'm alluding to uh, the Lord's Prayer. It's something that we don't always do, but the Holy Spirit must have laid that on your heart. And so we prayed that prayer today, and the first thing we said is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And again, we don't always see the depth of the significance of that. But what is the name of God? It's I am. I am. And, and if we, we, we hear that when Moses is, is grappling <laughs> with, with being uh, excommunicated or basically exiled from Egypt, he's grappling with this. And so he meets with God and, and, and Moses says to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, say to this people of Israel, the Lord, the I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered through all generations. I am. And it's interesting that we, as we read the Bible, and it's, it's, it's sad that we don't always, uh, we hear some names like, uh, you know, uh, Jehovah Jireh, which means the I am your provider. Uh, we hear John in the New Testament says God is love, which really this is I am love. I am peace. In fact, John talks about it when he's talking with, with the Pharisees. He says, are you, and they're asking him a question, are you, are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets who died? Who, who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me of whom you say he is our God. But you've not known him. I know him. If I were to say to you that I do not know him, I would be a liar. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, Well, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, he didn't say I was. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He declared to them the reality that he is God. He is the I am. In fact, his name, at which John starts out this gospel, all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. As I've shared with you and I share with many, that name is very important. We don't always consider, but it is Again, the name I am salvation. That's what Jesus stands for. I am salvation. And in John, John picks that up. The I am statements found in the Gospel of John are the I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the true vine. I am eight times John wants us to realize we are worshiping the I am. The psalmist says, gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Isn't this beautiful? Think about this. Just to look into God's face and, and, and realize who he is. to quiet our hearts. And, and, and I, one of the, my favorite psalms is that of 131, where it says, I've stilled and quieted my souls like a weaned child is my soul within me, O Lord. That this child that he's kind of using is, is somebody who is coming to their mother, not because they need something, but just to experience the oneness, the companionship, the sense of being together. Being weaned means they, they don't need to be fed. So the psalmist is saying, I just want to crawl up into your lap and to look into your face. That's what the psalmist is saying here about seeking your face. Just to look at the beauty. <laughs> I can remember that I was busy at my one time and my children were trying to get my attention and finally they grabbed my face and drew it to me and said, look at me, Dad. <laughs> I think God might say that to us every once in a while. Grab our face and say, would you just look at me? <laughs> and so we do need to take the time just to crawl up into God's lap and to gaze into the beauty of the I am. And then he goes on to say, and to inquire of you, if you want to go to the next slide, inquire of you in the temple. So, so the next thing that, that the psalmist is saying is really the next thing that we pray about in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, 
The only way I can know what God's will is to spend time listening to him, to inquire of him. What is your will in this situation? What do you want to do here? What do you want to do here? In fact, remember that band that the kids used to wear a number of years ago? Now, really showing my age. I did see somebody wearing this, though, the other day, a teen. It says, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Which basically is what's the question, asking Jesus, what would you do in this situation? And so the psalmist is saying, as I seek his face, not his hands, as I gaze upon his beauty, I open myself up and I begin to ask the question, what, what are you doing? And he goes on to, uh, we need to be like Samuel in some sense, where in verse 11 he says, teach me your ways, O Lord. And Samuel then, kind of in light of this, says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. How many of you spend time listening in prayer? Listening. I hate to say it often, our prayers are all these things we want God to do, and then we say, Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen, then we run out the door. But how many of you say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. What are you doing in this situation? What do you want to do in my life? Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Your kingdom come. Well, I like what Dallas Willard said once at a conference I was at. He, this, this man said, it went up to one of the college students and said, so how's your kingdom doing? He said, ah, I don't have any kingdom. He said, show me your billfold. So he pulled out his billfold and he said, there's an evidence of your kingdom. So what do you mean? He said, well, in that you have money to spend on things. You, you have, the, and so your kingdom is that area where you live and you're making the decisions. We think sometimes the kingdom is out there. It's dealing with Biden or Putin. No, no. The kingdom is, my kingdom is right here and now. My kingdom is with you today. My kingdom is with my family and so when we pray that prayer and we inquire of the Lord, God, how do you want me to live in the midst of my family? How do I make your kingdom real reign in my kingdom? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're really turning the reins over now to say, I don't want to run my life myself. I want to join you. Isn't it interesting? He says we're co-heirs that we will reign with him. Well, that doesn't start someday. <laughs> that starts the day you say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. We're now saying to him, I want to do life with you. I want to reign with you in my own kingdom. I don't want to reign without you in my own kingdom. I want to reign with you. So in, when we gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and when we inquire of him, we're really asking God to show us how to live the everyday. He goes on to say, lead me on level paths. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have to say this, that I have to realize that my life is kind of on a roller coaster, up and down. Boy, sometimes I'm really on fire and hot, and sometimes I'm pretty cold. Well, the, the, the psalmist is saying, lead me on level ground. In other words, keep me kind of on a straight path that continues upward and ever inward. Isaiah brings this up. He says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the I am has spoken. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. <laughs> so how do we prepare a way for the Lord? How do we become the John the Baptist? Is that we ask that he would lead us on level ground, that people would always see us ever marching upward and onward and inward toward Jesus. One of my prayers is, Lord, I pray. I pray that I will love you more today than I did yesterday. And I hope at the end of my life I can say, I love Jesus more than I ever have in my life. 
level ground. Always upward. Always onward. Always inward. To see the beauty of his face. To experience the oneness and the love relationship that we have. And so he ends this psalm with wait. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Now most of you and I, when we think about wait, it's kind of sitting down and waiting patiently for my wife to be done or the, for the doctor's appointment to call me in. It's kind of sitting there. But you know, I, I, that's a struggle for me because I hear a lot of people say, well, as Christians, we ought to be out there doing something. Well, why do we just sit back and do nothing? Well, this really does not say we do nothing. I looked up the word, and you can go to the next slide here. The Hebrew word is kawa. It's a primitive root, which means to bind together, <laughs> perhaps by twisting. I, I was watching alone, you know, the survivor show, many, maybe some of you have seen it, you know, where they go out and have to live all alone in the primitive and they have to kind of have only so many tools. And one of the things that they were doing, they, they had this, they got this twine and it was not very strong twine. It was pretty flimsy. And when they went to, it ripped. And so what did they do? They waited. They took those, each strand of those, and they began to twist them together to make a stronger rope. Uh, Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us this, he said, a, a single cord is easy to be broke, but a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And many times, you know, at weddings, they'll, they'll quote that verse and, and they'll talk about your one strand, your spouse is the other strand, and the third strand is Jesus. And when you bind yourself to Jesus, you won't be quickly broken. So the, the writer of this psalm asks us to wait on the Lord, to bind ourselves to what God's doing, to twist our lives with his, and to do what he's doing in a, this situation. And then he says that when we do that, then we're going to have courage. Courage comes from seeking and knowing the Lord. You know, at the beginning of this psalm, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord, the I am, is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He goes on to say, though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. Why? Because he's doing the very thing that he's inviting us to do at the end of the psalm, to bind ourselves to the Lord, to the I am. There's where we find our courage. There's where we can be confident. So our task, really, is to seek his face. You can go to the next slide. You know, Isaiah says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteousness their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. He goes on to say, God responding to that says, For my ways are not your thoughts and my thoughts are not your thoughts. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts. And my word does not go out and return to me void. It will accomplish what I send it out to do. Seek the Lord. Go to the next slide. In other words, <laughs> be a seeker. The first Saturday in October, our Area 3 is coming together for an annual gathering. And we're going to have David Fitch come to us. And the, and the title of our gathering is called Live Out Loud. Why the church exists. The church exists to live out loud. In fact, Peter says this in, in his letter. He says, but sanctify, Lord, and Jesus says, Lord, of your life. And always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have within you, yet with gentleness and respect. A seeker is looking to the beauty of the Lord and waiting upon him, bound with him, and together they go out 
sharing the beauty of the Lord with all the world. You see, as that revival went on at Asbury Seminary, and the president stood up and said, this is not the end, this is the beginning. Let them see us loving God. Let the world see how much we are changing because of the love of God that's within us. And he said, this is not just good news. This is the best news. The very best news. God so loved the world, we started out today, that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not die, but have eternal life. Be a seeker. Oh God, thank you for the opportunity to be here together with my brothers and sisters and to have you present with us. And I do pray that as we have focused and meditated upon your word, that you will now plant this word deep within good soil within us, that it may bear fruit. Lord, we have to admit sometimes our soil is like that hard ground. The word falls, the seed falls, and it's immediately forgotten. Other times we receive it with joy and we're ready to do this, but we get distracted. Or we are like the weedy soil, the distractions of the world, the worries and all those things kind of rob this word from us. So help us get the rocks out. Help us to till out the weeds so that good soil is available to hear your word and to produce fruit, to bring honor and glory to you, the one true God, and through Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And all God's people said, Amen. And I do hope you all know what hallelujah means. It means praise the I am. As you leave this week and this place, and as you go into the life and the places where God has you, remember, he said, I am with you always. May you know his presence. May you seek his face. May you inquire and know his love. Amen.